Good morning and welcome to St. Andrews on this second Sunday in Lent. Uh, as always, you can find the order of service on our website. And please feel free to put any prayer requests or thanksgiving in the chat. We begin with the opening acclamation. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multiple multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read responsibly today's psalm. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All, all you of Jacob's line give glory. For he, he does, does not, not despise us. nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. 
and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your de descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do I'm so sorry. what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this all quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter Peter, and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Mind the gap. If you have ever been on the London Tube, their extensive subway system, you probably remember hearing this phrase on the public address system in a lovely British accent. It's such, such a pithy and polite and very British way of telling people to pay attention. Pay attention and don't fall down that little gap between the train door and the station platform, dummy. I think Americans like this because it seems like such a quaint phrase, but it conveys a very useful warning, of course. And I was reminded of this phrase, mind the gap, while reading a sermon on today's gospel by Will Willimon. Willimon is a United Methodist bishop and is a professor at Duke University Divinity School. He's probably one of the best preachers in the country and has written many volumes about the craft of preaching and more devotional text. I, of course, can't do justice to Willimon's sermon in today's gospel, but his use of the metaphor of the gap was so compelling and really cast today's gospel in a new light um, for me. More on that later. This is a very well-known passage of scripture and entirely appropriate for our Lenten journey with its focus on true discipleship. It's a story full of tension and, I think, anxiety. Around this part in the Gospel of Mark, things begin to change. Earlier, there's a focus on Jesus' miracles. From this point on, the narrative shifts to Jesus' words about his suffering and death, culminating with his passion and crucifixion. It's a crucial turning point. So picture the scene. Jesus and his disciples are together, and Jesus says that he must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the religious authorities, and be killed and raised again. Wait, hold up. Just before this, Peter had made his confession. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And now we have this very un-Messiah prediction about the future. Messiahs weren't supposed to act like this. Messiah literally means anointed, set apart. Messiahs led rebellions. Messiahs freed people. Messiahs were prophets. Messiahs don't suffer. Messiahs don't die, because what would be the point then? So Peter rebukes Jesus, probably out of fear or confusion, Jesus rebukes him back, get behind me, Satan. And to the assembly of those gathered, these chilling, confusing words, this church that, the church, that 
this charge that the church has been wrestling with from since the beginning. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Wow. I imagine the response was shock, confusion, fear, and perhaps a feeling of betrayal even. Wasn't Jesus the one to come to free people from Roman oppression? And here is where Willeman's metaphor comes in. Jesus is God coming close to us in a radical way. But Jesus also reveals that great distance, the gap between us and God. And moreover, there is a gap between how we want God to be and how God really is at times. A gap between our priorities and those things which God finds important, all expressed in the life and the ministry of Jesus. And you have to feel for Peter, don't you? The deep longing for God to shake up the world, throw off the yoke of oppression, and instead, Jesus talks about taking up our cross and giving our lives in a sacrificial manner to the benefit of the world. Ironically, by losing our life, we gain life. Discipleship, following Jesus, aligning our priorities with Christ is hard work, and there really is a gap about how we want God to be and how God really is in some ways, and I think we all fall into this. For many evangelical Christians, discipleship is defined by following Jesus and all the good things that have happened to us if we do that. I was an alcoholic, I gambled, I was unfaithful, but I found Jesus and now I'm a new man or woman. These are all good things, but they're all individual, aren't they? Aren't they? There's a gap between our desire to see God as some benefactor who rewards us for doing good and maybe punishes us for doing bad. And we are also guilty of this, seeing discipleship, doing what we think God wants us to do as a sign and proof that we are good and virtuous. We're the Christians who welcome everyone. We're the ones who focus on the goodness of God rather than the rules. And make no mistake, this is a very good thing, and we should do this. But it's when we do this to affirm our own individual sense of righteousness is when we fall into the trap that Jesus rebukes Peter for. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Because as Jesus teaches and lives, discipleship is very hard. It requires and calls us to take up our cross of self-sacrifice, not because it will make our lives happier or better or get us into heaven, or even to reassure us that we're doing Christianity right, but because self-sacrifice, concern, and service to others the willing to love with so much abandon that we give up our lives for others, that is real discipleship. That is radical. That is the cross that we are called to carry. And for Jesus, who, who can, and, and for Jesus, we cannot be served but to serve. We gave of his life being of loving service. The result was crucifixion and death. That is the gap between the world's expectation and the reality of life lived in Christ. As Willeman writes, there is a gap between us and God. That gap has a face, a name, Jesus. Discipleship is risking that gap in order that we might bring close to the, to the true, untamed, living God. Jesus is that gap and bridges it, calling us to sacrificial love, to a new way of being that moves us from our natural tendency to think about ourselves first, the natural tendency to ask, what's in it for me? The natural tendency to ask, 
look, I'm the right kind of Christian. But the glorious and sometimes frightening truth is that Jesus invites us to make that leap between the God we want and the God who is. And what an appropriate time to consider our own discipleship this Lent. Where is God calling you to sacrificial living? Where is God calling you to give of yourself for the benefit of the world and the kingdom of God? Where do you find the call of Jesus to follow him? And where is that call far from what the world values and thinks important? Where is your cross? We know the story. Jesus' ministry, his teaching, his healing, his service and sacrifice lead to his death on the cross. But that cross shows us the way to bridge that gap between us and God, our priorities and the God that values and is defined by love. We know the story of how it ends. Lent moves us ever closer to it. Jesus' death calls us to discipleship and living our lives for others. And Jesus' resurrection destroys the powers of death and closes that gap between us and God forever. Mind the gap this Lent. And always. Amen. We affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people, excuse me. As Abraham followed the will of God and was rewarded with an everlasting covenant, through our baptism, we have entered the covenant of God's love, to whom we offer our prayers, responding, Christe eleison. That we may be convinced that God fulfills God's promises and bearing witness to all that we have seen and heard through Holy Scripture, the traditions of our faith, and the reasoning and experience of the community of the baptized, Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. For the poor and dispossessed, children who are homeless, adults who are unemployed, 
and for all whose anxiety and stress seem too much to bear, that Jesus will give us the humility to respond to their needs through our ministry. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. For the church, that we may reach out to those who have no religious home and share with them the freedom that comes from an acknowledgement of sin, a turning of life, and the acceptance of God's merciful forgiveness. Remembering especially Michael, our presiding bishop, and Alan and Gail, our bishops. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joe, our president, and Charlie, our governor, that they may be led to wise decisions for the welfare of all people. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. For those on our parish prayer list, especially those we name now, either silently or aloud. that they may be healed in body, mind, and spirit. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. For those who have died, especially those we name now, either silently or aloud. John, Eric. That they may join in the heavenly chorus of all the saints. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. For those people and communities on our diocesan cycle of prayer, Trinity Chapel, Oak Bluffs, Church of the Holy Spirit, Orleans, St. Peter's Church, Osterville, Christ Church, Plymouth, and the Boston Episcopal Charitable Society, that they may be supported and empowered in their various ministries. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations, and as you know the weakness of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace and good morning again. Uh, not a lot of announcements today as we continue our Lenten journey. Uh, a very special thank you to our Scola this morning, uh, Chuck and Joni, and Becky, and of course, as always, to Sean. Um, I think that's about, about it. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. continue with Eucharistic Prayer C. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you're worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, sun, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you reveal your righteous law. In the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. We celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. 
Lord God of our ancestors, God of Abraham and Sarah, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body and one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your Church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Amen. For those not able to receive the blessed sacrament this morning, I invite you to join with me in this prayer for a spiritual communion. In union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful gathered at every altar of your church, where your body and blood are offered this day, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection for the means of grace and the hope of glory. I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all of my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until, by your grace, I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in his sac- uh, in blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bow down in the presence of God. Grant, Almighty God, that your people may recognize their weakness and put their whole trust in your strength, so that they may rejoice forever in the protection of your loving providence. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.